Hello, I'm James Williams and this is Men's Matters. Uh, this latest edition of Men's Matters is about the um, horrible subject of parental alienation syndrome. Um, that is where you get a, a split in families and one parent tends to uh, denigrate the other parent uh, by using the children. Uh, it's a strategy that unfortunately has um, existed down through the ages, uh, but it was uh, Dr. Richard Gardner back in the 90s, I believe it was, who coined the phrase parental alienation syndrome. Uh, now, I'm going to be con playing an interview with a couple of authors and uh, writers of this particular book, Can't Explain, and that's written by Luke Matthews and Julie Burkhart. Um, they came along to my studio and we had a good discussion about the writing of the book, what it meant and stuff like this. Uh, in fact, it related very closely to the experience of the, one of the writers anyway, and he was particularly concerned about uh, the effect of it may have if he was traced by the perpetrator of the abuse, I would say, because that is what parental alienation syndrome is. It's a form of abuse, not just of the parent, but particularly of the child. You can buy this for uh, £7.99, which is uh, quite a low cost uh, in today's prices. It's, it's produced by uh, a firm called the Choir Press, but you can get it through Amazon. And I would certainly recommend it as good reading. Uh, I found it quite uh, quite gripping, really, and it was a, a really good explanation of uh, what happens to take a perfectly good relationship between a child and a parent and destroy it, basically. Uh, to me, such an act is an act of evil. Now, hatred is not an emotion that comes naturally to a child. It has to be taught. Uh, and a parent who would teach a child to hate or fear the other parent, to me, does represent a grave and persistent danger to the mental and emotional health of that child. And uh, for those who are students of, uh, of PAS, as it's known, PAS, Parental Alienation Syndrome, uh, you know, it's, it's not uncommon for children growing up into adults to be permanently psychologically damaged. The uh, sad thing about this particular case and, and this particular child involved in this story is that the young lady concerned, the child, now young lady, is receiving psychiatric treatment. That's the last we know about it. Um, it's, a, it's a tragedy and I find some of the social services that are supposed to be around to protect the interests and welfare of children utterly fail when it comes to parental alienation. Uh, you know, it's something that they seem to be almost deliberately inadequate uh, about dealing with. I wonder as well, we, you know, I, I'm, I'm a critic of feminism. And I wonder how much of an element that feminism has to play in that. From my encounters with social services, many of the social services workers are pro-feminist. And, you know, uh, to me, what rings up is bigot. <laughs> and when you allow your bigotry to allow a child to be harmed then you are no longer fit for the job you're meant to do. In other words, the protection of children. Now, what children of divorce most want and need is to maintain a healthy and strong relationship with both of their parents. They don't want to be involved in the conflicts. They feel it, and many of them feel uh, guilty that they have been they've been the cause of the conflicts. And for a parent to foster the child's rejection of another parent is child abuse. It is wrong and it should be regarded as such. It is it's one of the worst forms of domestic violence you can, can have. Uh, and I think it's, it's not even properly recognised that, as that, you know, in, in many circles. Uh, Richard Gardner 
defined it as a disorder that arises primarily in the context of child custody disputes. This is quoting him. Its primary manifestation is the child's campaign of denigration against a parent, a campaign that has no justification. It results from the combination of a programming, that's i.e. a brainwashing of the parent's indoctrinations and the child's own contributions to the vilification of the target parents. Now, as I understand it, uh, one of the things about children is they fear uh, being isolated and abandoned. So if one parent is forced to leave the home, and it's not always, when a, when a, so when a parent leaves the home, it's not always because they don't care. Most of the time they do very much care. But the abuse within the home has become intolerable. And if you're in the man's situation, there's very little support for men who take their children with them. It's very hard to get uh, a shelter or somewhere you can go to. And this is another aspect of uh, social bigotry that exists against men in particular and fathers, that there aren't any places for them to go. And I found that um, a lot of uh, dads that leave, uh, couple, leave leave their partners are not feckless fathers. Yeah, you're going to get one or two that are, and they will be certainly highlighted by the people who don't like dads anyway. A lot of them do leave because of the domestic abuse that they themselves are suffering in that home. Parental alienation is more common than is often assumed. There's some researchers called uh, Fiddler and Barla, don't ask me their first names. Back in uh, 2010, in one of their reports, estimated that parental alienation occurred in between 11 and 15% of divorces where children were involved. Uh, another set of researchers, Burnett uh, et al, as a known, well, that's a group of them of course, also in 2010, estimated that 1% of children and adolescents in North America experience parental alienation. Some of the effects on children that uh, PAS can have is it can lead to low self-esteem and self-hatred, a lack of trust, depression, substance abuse and other forms of addiction and children lose the capacity to give and accept love from a parent. Uh, it, it damages them for life. I've already stressed that. And I think it's an horrendous thing to subject any child or person to. Doing a review of Can't Explain. It's written in the third person. Uh, the character is called Paul Nelson. The story is laced with diary entries that lend authenticity to the plot. Paul's a, a normal nice guy and becomes a proud father to his daughter Cara. And like most parents, he, he uh, looks to ensure her welfare and happiness. But the mother, Phoenix, as she's called in the book, has other ideas. And it wastes little time in describing the physical appearances of the characters involved, but goes straight into the uh, personality and involvements of, of them all. It's a thoroughly engaging uh, true life drama, and that's the importance of it. it. It relates to a real story that really does happen. And if you've ever experienced Paz, I thoroughly suggest you read this book. Uh, it, it, is, it is a really good, a really good read. I think when he wrote the book, Luke Matthews and Julia Bern Burkhardt, uh, they didn't intend to put it in, but what I read as I read through it, was the mother was basically displaying signs of psychopathy. Uh, she really was, which brings on to the subject of uh, alienators. Are they narcissistic by nature? Are they psychopathic by nature? In some ways, there's a compelling argument for that. Why would you deliberately harm a child, allow your own venom and hatred to hurt your own child, to get at another person. Why would you want to do that? Can't explain. It's very good value for money, I found. And uh, if you read through it, it can save you a lot of misery. 
To me, it's a disturbing reflection of 21st century society. And it also shows the lack of support for male victims' domestic abuse. What I would suggest from reading this book is that you learn as much as you can about parental alienation and psychopaths, preferably before entering into a relationship with one and having children with them. And I know that uh, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but understand that using children as weapons against a parent is a form of domestic abuse and you should take action as early as possible. Don't keep uh, backing off, don't keep retreating. If the other parent is pushy and trying to dictate terms to you, then that's a big indicator that something is not right with that other person. If you do get to the stage where you are forced to break up the relationship, apply for shared residency immediately and don't rely on contact orders and parental responsibility to, to give you your rights because the parent who has the child Basically, it's nine-tenths of the law in their favour. Record everything. Phone calls, videos, make copies of all correspondence, even birthday cards. Keep a diary, but don't keep things where the other parent can access it. So if you're living in the home with that other parent and things are going astray, don't keep your diary there. Keep it in the office or somewhere private where that other parent cannot get hold of. It's very important. Now, prepare on the assumption that false allegations will be made because they will be. It's part of the uh, disabling side of things that the uh, alienating parents do. They target you. There are no rules. They will, there's no sort of how low can you get because they will, will, will try anything to cause you and make your life a misery. The police do not have an enviable record when it comes to equality regarding men. It's not uncommon for men to be arrested and spend the night in a cell on the strength of a malicious allegation. And the courts too are not renowned for their fairness where men are concerned. Males across the board receive tougher sentences and too many innocent men get sent down the strength of a woman's word. If Paz is suspected, ensure that the social services are notified as soon as possible and that they have recorded the complaint. It may prove useful for suing them later should they fail to take appropriate action to protect a child from abuse. And bear in mind that social services child protection agencies or whatever they might call the legal profession and the family courts attract feminists to their ranks both male and female feminists and the in instinct of these people is to automatically regard men as guilty and treat them like low-life criminals in spite of any evidence that may suggest otherwise okay on with the uh, interview with uh, Luke Matthews and Julie Burkhardt hope you enjoy it. Thank you. In order to help to protect his identity, Luke Matthews' voice has been deliberately deepened in this interview. OK, I'm James Williams and this is Men's Matters. Now this time we're going to be talking about a book called Can't Explain, which goes into the trauma and terrors of parental alienation syndrome. For those who don't know about it, there's plenty of stuff on the internet, but I'm fortunate to have uh, Luke Matthew and his co-author Julie in the studio with us. I'd be interested to know, why did you write that book? Well, James, it's based on my personal experiences. Um, I have a daughter myself who's um, 18 now. I went through a rather acrimonious divorce with her mother about 15 years ago. To cut a long story short, I haven't seen my daughter in the last 10 years. Her mind has been poisoned against me, so much so that she's made up uh, false allegations against me and uh, she was finally adopted by her a stepfather, so I've lost all contact with her and it was those experiences that made me want to write my book and alert other people to the term that you've been describing, parental alienation. Uh, what sort of things did you experience from her? What sort of false allegations did she make against you? 
physical abuse, that I hit her, uh, that I locked her in her room, that I stopped her having contact with her mother when she came over for visits, uh, that I wouldn't let her use the phone to telephone her. Uh, and things like um, I wouldn't turn up on time uh, for prearranged visits to pick her up for when she was coming over to my place to stay. Uh, you know, I, I was fortunate in that she, uh, when she was younger she'd come and stay for one weekend a month, maybe two weekends a month, and it was great, and we had great times together. But slowly those times were eroded. And uh, eventually my daughter wrote me a letter saying that she didn't want to see me anymore. And this is when she was about eight years old. And it had very adult influence in, in its um, content, clearly not being written by an eight-year-old. Well, I read the book and I found it quite gripping and uh, very, very disturbing. Uh, it's a very, very good read. And anyone, any parent, that's man or woman, is going through that sort of trauma and, uh, and pain... Uh, would do well to read this book and uh, I would say it's very good value for money and uh, I, I just read it and could see how you'd written it, it was the, just the deterioration throughout as a prolonged deterioration that ended up as it has today one of the things I, I thought was uh, early on when you look back at what you'd written the uh, abuse which is actually abuse from the mother towards you through the daughter the abuse had started before your relationship had broken down. And I could see that she was isolating you from friends and family before, the, before she made the final accusation that you'd, uh, you'd two-timed her or something. Yes, I don't know whether that was an intentional or not, or not. But yes, I certainly did lose contact with my friends and family. Yeah, why that happened, I, I'm not sure whether she, she did that intentionally. I, I really can't say, but it did happen, yes. Mm. Well, because you did say that... Um, one from relatives that spoke about it later that she had been kind of hostile to them like on the telephone or in exchanges so I'd picked up that from there uh, and the, the effect of parental alienation sy uh, syndrome on your daughter uh, in the latter part of the book you described how she was actually uh, suffering a, a psychotic behaviour Yes uh, and this was something that I actually didn't know about it was kept from me intentionally apparently uh, my daughter was seeing a psychiatrist, but I wasn't allowed to know anything about it due to patient confidentiality, and my ex-wife had purposely kept all this from me. And as I say, I didn't actually know anything about it, so I didn't get an opportunity to put my side of the story across as to why my daughter was suffering these psychotic episodes. When you became aware of these accusations and the abuse that you were, came to realise was going on, uh, you reported it to social services, did you? Uh, before the, those serious allegations, I reported to social services that I wasn't happy that um, I was being denied access to my daughter uh, by my ex-wife on, on occasions and that, that my daughter was sh showing some signs of um, that, that disturbed behaviour and she, she, she was starting to to not want to come and visit for some reason. I couldn't work out why this was. So I raised this with social services and expressed that, you know, perhaps I thought my, my ex-wife was poisoning her mind against me in, in some respects. Uh, but social services just said um, uh, it wasn't a serious enough issue at that point in time to uh, warrant any of their time. And so that what they suggested was I take it to court through a solicitor. Well, when the, ch the child is actually suffering uh, what is, amounts to psychological abuse, it's not really a court setting that she needs. In your book, you describe parental alienation syndrome, although straight away you don't identify it as such. It, later on, you identify it as such. But the book basically describes that sort of thing. I also detected uh, that the, your ex-wife had some psychopathic traits, which is very, very disturbing in that she lacked remorse, she was very vindictive, very unpredictable, uh, everything was your fault, she was uh, not to be blamed for anything. But uh, in the book, and from the book and from your own experience and research, can you describe what parental alienation syndrome comes out as? The child just shows an unjustified hatred for the parent that has been accused of not doing 
Their job, probably, is just an unjustified hatred towards their alienated parent. How do you think that uh, evolves? How does the child s- develop that? Is that the parent telling them or drilling them or whatever it may be? Yes, but I believe it's like a, a drip feed. I mean, in the old days, I think they would probably call this poisoning of the mind or brainwashing. But now we've got this term parental alienation, I think, which, which covers it very nicely. Uh, I think the term in uh, legal thing is implacable hostility. I think they've used that before. That's another description of it. But it's the same thing, just called something else. What was, when it came to actually, she said, you said she made false allegations against you. How did the social, social services and CAFCAS react then? Well, I obviously denied them because they were, were, were totally false. Um, but social services and CAFCAS just didn't believe me. Uh, in fact, CAFCAS went as far as saying in, in an interview, our policy is to always believe the child. Now, to bear in mind that these allegations were also coming from my child, uh, from my daughter at this point as well. And I believe that was uh, because her mind had been poisoned so much by her mother. One of the things I've noticed with people who are going through this, it does help having a supportive partner. Don't you? Yes, I do have uh, a partner at home who was extremely supportive throughout all of this. So as co-author of this book, uh, how did you get involved yourself? Why did you get involved in it? Well, I've known Luke for a number of years now and obviously being friends with him and his partner and obviously observing from an outside point of view of what he was going through. And because of, because of my um, tra- uh, nurse training that I've had, I recognised certain behavioural characteristics that didn't seem quite right so I helped Luke understand perhaps from a woman's side of things what was actually happening and what he was going through. Had you had much experience yourself before on this sort of thing? I have had a breakup in a marriage um, before of what could have been perceived as me alienating my children and against my first husband but as my story could unfold was that I was actually protecting my child children rather than alienating and I think that's a good very important point that we must um, highlight that protection of a child is different to an alienation of a child. Yeah that's that is a very important point because of course um Behind this, we can't just say that all um, separations between children and parents are parental alienation syndrome. There are those who are genuinely suffering that are threats to the child. But in uh, in Luke's case, he produced the evidence to show that he was not abusive. And uh, what's disturbing is the social services are supposed to be for the protection of the child, could not recognise the actual fact the accusations against him were false and proven to be false. Therefore they were allowing a child to continue to exist with an abusive parent. That's, that's very true, yes. And, and um, Luke didn't know where he, when, where he was coming from or where they were coming from, you know, because he couldn't see what actions he was taking to be abusive. He was being told the, the accusations that he knew weren't true. And obviously they were um, acknowledged as being lies uh, and made up false allegations against him. And uh, Luke, your partner, she obviously went through a lot of trauma like you did, shared problems with you. In what way was she supportive and how did she help? Well, she obviously knew that these uh, allegations were false, obviously, so she was somebody that I could talk to all the time uh, about it because it, you feel when you're accused of these types of crimes you feel you can't talk to anybody out there both myself and my partner we're teachers and if this type of thing had got out into the open world we'd probably have both lost our jobs I was actually told by a CAFCAS officer that if we'd have had children of our own they'd have been taken away into care because of these allegations even though there was absolutely no evidence whatsoever to support any of them well, that in itself is quite an horrendous thing. And I know I've come across people who've found that uh, the threat of having your children taken away is worse than the threat of a prison sentence uh, because that is you know, something extremely personal. 
And uh, unfortunately, if this thing is going on all the time and the social services and CAFCAS are incapable of recognising and dealing with it, then surely, from your point of view, do you find also that they are not fit for, for purpose? Absolutely, James. Uh, one of the reasons that I wrote this book, although it's based on my personal experiences, and it's a fictionalised account of my personal experience, fictionalised in that I've changed names and places just to help protect our identities. One of the reasons I wrote this book is because I know what happened to me is happening up and down this country to many people. I talk to people and everybody I talk to knows of at least one person that it's either happened to or is happening to. It's a very, very common story. And a lot of people will say that CAFCAS and social services are not fit for purpose. Well, what, is, what do you think is wrong with them? Well, we can go into um, many different reasons. One, I would say there's a very poor understanding of parental alienation. Now, whether that's due to a lack of knowledge, a genuine lack of knowledge, or whether they choose to ignore it, uh, that it exists, I, I'm not sure. I do believe that in certain circumstances, it certainly happened in my case, that... Uh, I had strong reasons to believe that the officers investigating my case were women that perhaps had a bias against men. Perhaps they had their own fixed agendas to follow. Perhaps they considered a relationship of their own had failed due to the man, had let them down some, for some reason in their own relationships. And as a consequence, they seemed drawn to these types of professions where they could take it out on men, perhaps. But having said that, you know, I, I do recognise there are probably some excellent professionals working in, the, in this, this field, so I wouldn't want to tie everyone with the same brush. But all I can talk about are my personal experiences and the experiences that people have told me uh, of their own where they've experienced something similar. Yeah, uh, having said that, though, um, without wanting to cast aspersions against the social services, uh, uh, but... In, I, I work in a professional job myself, and I know that if there are people who are not up to scratch, then they get identified and uh, the, the problem gets addressed. Surely social services should have something to uh, assess whether the people working for them are able to produce objective reports and re to not be affected by their own subjective bias. I totally agree with you. One of the things I did after my experiences was try and report it further up the chain, whether it was to the General Social Services Council or even the Ombudsman uh, that deals with these types of issues, uh, Ofsted. But everywhere I went, there, there were closed doors. Nobody wanted to listen to me. Hence, one of the reasons for the title of the book, Can't, can't Explain. It was just a lot of closed doors. Well, very disturbing. And, and OK, going through uh, parental alienation is particularly harrowing for anyone that's going through that. Uh, can you describe some of the symptoms that you've suffered because of what's happened? Well, physically, you know, you can't sleep, you can't eat, typical things like that when, when you're worried. Uh, mentally, it really takes it out of you. And emotionally, you start feeling extremely guilty. Um, and you, you, you even start wondering if perhaps these things really did happen uh, and you need to be brought back by someone you know I was so lucky that I had my partner uh, and close friends and family around me you know to say look you've got nothing to feel guilty about it's not you that's done anything wrong here but you can't help that feelings those, those feelings uh, you also feel that you know you've let your family down to a degree because it wasn't just me that was suffering my parents were also suffering. It's a granddaughter that they've lost. They've done nothing wrong as well. And you do constantly feel like you're banging your head on a brick wall. No one will listen to you. Even though you've got all the evidence there, but they just will not listen, whether, whether they choose to not listen or whether they haven't got the time to listen or whether they're just so biased. Just, just can't explain. Your daughter, uh, obviously, she's uh, still living through this and she obviously plays on your mind. I've, I've had people say before that it's like a living bereavement. It, that must be how it feels for you. Exactly, it does. And in, in, in some respects, uh, it, it, 
it's easier in some respects, but more difficult in others, because I know she's still out there, and I would actually love to reach out and just tell her how I feel and how much I still love her and want to put this situation right. But social services and CAFCAS have made that virtually impossible for me because they have told me not to make contact. So they basically uh, exacerbated the abuse, really? Absolutely. Along the way, there were some. There must have been some support organisations, even if they could only just give advice that, that could have helped you in some way. Uh, are you able to describe any of them or name any of them that might be useful for somebody listening who's going through this? Yeah, there were a number of organisations that I contacted. I did find that some of them did have their... Although they understood what I was going through, they did have their hands tied somewhat in, in terms of practical support they could offer. But there were, there were a couple of organisations that were provided some fantastic emotional support and one sticks in my mind is FASO, the False Allegation Support Organisation. Uh, and I uh, dealt with some people on the phone there and they were very supportive, sympathetic and understanding. Yeah, I've, I, it's Margaret Gardner, of course, and uh, I've, I found her to be exceptional in her uh, understanding of people and... Uh, She's, uh, you know, if I could give someone an extra 10 years of life, I'd, would she be the one? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. To buy the book, to get hold of the book, uh, or you've got a website for it, have you? Uh, can you tell what the address is, how someone can get hold of this? Yes, the address site for the book is www.cantexplain.co.uk and there you'll find a little bit more information about the authors, i.e. myself, Luke Matthews and Julie Burkhart. And there's also details there of how to buy the book, which will be available on Amazon between mid-March and the end of March of this year. We haven't got the exact launch date yet, yeah. but it'll be there. And for people listening very late in there, that's 2014, March. <laughs> that's correct, yes. <laughs> uh, Julie, uh, being, being a, a lady involved in this, you obviously recognise that it's not just men that suffer from parental alienation sy syndrome or the alienated parent. It does happen to women as well. Is that is that what encouraged you to join in with with Luke in writing this book? Yes, certainly. I mean, I mean, it, parental alienation can happen to both men and women. Both men, men and women can be victims of parental alienation, and um, can suffer the likenesses in the syndrome that um, parental alienation is. You know, and the the allegations that prop up. Uh, we've had it from Luke give the uh, website address. Can we have a woman's voice giving the website <laughs> address as well? Yes, certainly. It's www.cantexplain.co.uk. OK, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, Luke and Julie for coming to the studio and describing your book. And uh, anyone out there, if you've got nothing else to do, uh, go out, find the book and buy it. And give it to friends if you don't read it. Or read it first, then give it to friends. But it is worth a read and it's worth to, if you want to enhance your understanding of this problem, and it is a serious problem, it does end up in deaths and suicides and horrible things like that and people with breakdowns and it ruins children's lives perhaps for the rest of their lives. And this is something which is, it's, it's a blight that is not being addressed. And uh, if I could find something nice to say about the social service in this thing, I will say it. But... So far, I have not found anything nice about it. And they're, they're letting children down. They're letting innocent people down. So it's time this was changed. We are in the 21st century. We're not living in the dark ages anymore. It's time. However, that's all we've got time for on Men's Matters on this episode. Until next time, take care of yourselves, wherever you are. Thank you.